What's up? Welcome to the stack. Welcome back if you've been here before. I'm Neon Mushroom and today we have some EDH Commander gameplay content for you guys. Quick caveat, this was originally recorded to be a CEDH game and this is kind of before, this is an older game. I'm um, not super old, but like maybe a month ago it was recorded and we sat down to like try playing some CEDH and um, the decks weren't quite tuned the way we'd like them to be and this game really wasn't played under the pretense of like not just what it means to build decks for CEDH but what it means to go into a game of magic with the pretense that we are playing CEDH. So I'm not going to label the video as a CEDH game. For all intents and purposes, this is just a very high power level game. Anyway, that's everything you guys should need to know before we actually play the game. So let's go ahead and take a look at who's playing, what decks they've decided to play, what opening hands they've decided to keep, as well as our normal upkeep stuff. As always, if you like this show or any of our other shows on YouTube, liking, sharing, and subscribing helps us out immensely. If you like our content and don't mind that extra mile, you can always support us over on Patreon, over at patreon.com backslash mtgthestack. Just like you, Rob B. See, I know I did like the card thing for your last one, but with this one, like the last one I did with Yuriko, but this one, I, it's different because I... New shout out, new deck. I don't know, man. Comment down below any of your thoughts and feelings, and we hope you enjoy the show. All right, first up, there's me playing Yuriko, the Tiger Shadow, and this is going to be a very competitive tune of the deck. The idea is to use Yuriko as a farming piece early on in the game, developing my hand. In an end game, I want to try to win by either burning my opponents out with Yuriko herself, or eventually putting together a Thassa's Oracle Demonic Consultation combo. I'm lucky enough to be keeping a seven card hand, including Doomsday, Mist Syndicate Naga, Demonic Consultation, Skull Snatcher, Wing Crafter, City of Brass, and a basic island. Next up, we have Calvin playing his take on a Mad Farm list, and the partner pairing he has selected for today is Timna the Weaver and Dargo the Shipwrecker. The game plan is to use Timna early to farm as many cards as possible and assemble a combo that allows you to cast and sacrifice Dargo an arbitrarily high number of times to proc some type of wing condition that's going to bleed all of his opponents dry. Calvin's also in the seven card hand club, keeping a Ranger Captain of Eos, a Cabal Ritual, Tithe Taker, Blood Pet, Arcane Signet, a soul ring and an urborg. Next up, we have Chris Shavers returning to the channel, and this time around, he's going to be bringing his Chainer Nightmare Adept mid-range deck. The idea is to use Chainer to enable a bunch of combos out of the graveyard, and eventually try to win the game using something like a World Gorger Dragon and Animate Deadloop. Or in some cases, he can just try to grind all of his opponents out of the game the hard way. Chris is also keeping a seven-card hand with a Plague Crafter, a Squee, Valakut Awakening, Dockside Extortionist, Soul Ring. Ash Barons, and a basic mountain. Last but certainly not least, we have Guy Scott returning to the channel with his Niv Mizzet Pay Run deck. This is going to be a control deck that looks to maintain control over the board for the early part of the game and eventually progress to his late game where he plays Niv Mizzet and puts a Curiosity on top of it, allowing him to deal an arbitrarily high amount of damage to each of his opponents to win the game. And with Guy, that's four of us keeping seven card hands, and his includes a Gush, a Delay, Mystic Remora, Opt, Arcane Signet, Soul Ring, and a basic island. All right, everyone good? Guys, 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 guys. It's time for the card game. Ah! I'm Calvin. I'm gonna get the one that wins. Take the one that wins real quick. Okay, one, two, three, flip. You told me. It's Calvin. <laughs> I think my hand. Ba -da -ba -da -ba Hear me out. Urborg, Tomb of Yagma. Tap it. I would like to cast a Soul Ring. Happen. Tap it. I would like to cast an Arcane Signet. Happen. Tap it. I'd like to cast a Blood Pet. Happen. On tap up, you draw? Yep. Draw. So Island. Nice. Tap it. I would like to cast a Wing Crafter. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is just going to draw his card for turn, play a Basic Mountain as his land for turn, tap it to play a Soul Ring, and with that, he'll pass the turn over to Guy. I'll play Island. I'll tap. I'll play. We're in it. I'll tap it. I'll play an Now that's what I'm going to play. And I'll play a sad Mystic Room. Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> Poor oh. fish. I want to go not last right, so Calvin, bad. After getting punished hard for turn order, we're going to go to Calvin's turn, where he'll draw his card for turn, and then shock in a godless shrine. After that, he's going to tap for three mana to cast one of his commanders, Timna the Weaver, but that resolving, he's going to head into combat, and he'll attack Guy with his Blood Pet. Guy's going to take one from the damage, and then in Calvin's second main phase, he'll lose a life and draw a card per his commander. After that, he'll just pass the turn to me. 
I'll draw my card for turn, then I'll play an underground river as my land for turn, and go into combat, I'm gonna attack Guy with my Wingcrafter. Before damage, I'll obviously ninjutsu in Yuriko, so Guy takes one commander damage, then Yuriko triggers, and I reveal Commandeer, dealing seven damage to each of my opponents. Then I'll try to go to discard, but before I can, Chris will basic land cycle Ash Barons, and he's gonna get a basic swamp and put it into his hand. Then I'm going to go to discard, and I'm going to put a wonder in my graveyard, which will give all of my creatures flying because I control an island. After that, Chris is going to draw his card for turn and play a basic swamp as his land for turn. Then he's going to tap for two mana, and he's going to leave one floating from the soul ring because he wants to cast a dockside extortionist. When that enters play, he's going to get a total of five treasures, and after those come into play, he's immediately going to crack four of them for black and red mana and cast his commander, Chainer, Nightmare Adept. I'm going to slaughter pack my dockside. I Trigger. get it. I'll draw Activate. Card. Guys, just yeah. anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Activate yes. Chainer. Oh yeah, it's but still the a slaughter pack, so let's... Uh, discard Squee. Uh, I will recast the dock side. Paying the um, treasure? Yeah. And Guy has priority. Guy, got anything to say about that? I think I do. You just top that. No, it. you don't. Yeah. Dude. No, you don't. I can't let you do that again. Unless you can. <laughs> I, nothing's gonna happen. All right, go ahead. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just roll a 20 for charisma. Like, <laughs> don't worry. Anyway, when's the if you just <laughs> If you just yell loud enough, no one will do anything about it. After talking Guy out of interacting, he's going to spend three of his five treasures in order to make black and cast a Plague Crafter. When this enters play, we're all going to have to sacrifice a creature. Chris will obviously sacrifice Dockside Extortionist. I'll sacrifice my Yuriko. Calvin will get rid of Blood Pet. And then with nothing else, we'll move back to Guy's turn where he's going to untap and pay the Mystic Remora attacks, then I'll draw his card for turn. In his first main phase, he'll tap his Arcane Signet to cast Opt. He's going to look at the top card of his library, and he's going to decide he wants to scry it on top, so we'll put it back and then draw it. Then he's going to play a basic island as his land for turn. After that, he decides he'd like to use the rest of his available mana, so he taps for two, and he's going to cast a Merchant Scroll. That's going to have him tutoring up a blue instant, and in this case, he wants to grab a Muddle the Mixture. After that, he's going to put that into his hand and pass the turn to Calvin. Calvin's going to untap, draw his card for turn, then in his first main phase he'll play a Cavern of Souls, and he'll name Human as it enters play. After that he'll go to combat and attack me with his commander for two, gain two life from damage, and then in his second main phase, lose a life and draw a card. At this point he decides he'd like to tutor two, so he's going to tap for three and cast Ranger Captain of Eos. When it comes into play, he's going to tutor a one drop from his deck, and in this case he wants a Hope of Giapir. He's going to add that to his hand, and then still in his second main phase, he'll tap a Soul Ring for two, play the Hope, let the extra mana drain, and pass the turn to me. I'm going to untap and draw my card for turn, and in my first main phase I'll play Dark Slick Shores as my land for turn. After that I'm going to tap out completely for a blue, a black, and a colorless, and I'll use the blue in order to cast a Wing Crafter, and I'll use the remaining two mana to cast Skull Snatcher and Soul Bond it with the Wing Crafter, so they both have two instances of flying now. After that I'll pass to Chris, where he'll pay for a Slaughter Pack trigger, buy back Squee, draws card for turn, and then in his first main phase he's going to activate Chainer, and he'll discard Squee to it. This is going to be so he can pay for two mana, and he's going to recast a card from his graveyard. In this case, he wants to recast Dockside Extortionist. The Dockside is going to resolve, so he's going to make six treasures when it comes into play. Then he's immediately going to use one of the treasures and cycle a Forgotten Cave. That's going to let him draw a card. After that, he wants to use the remaining treasures to cast Kakusho, the Evening Star. This is also going to resolve, so after that he's going to go to combat, and he's going to use his Plague Crafter and his Dockside Extortionist to attack me for a grand total of 4. I won't block, so I'm going to drop down to 33. After that, he's going to play a Valakut Stoneforge tapped as his land for turn, and just pass the turn to Guy. Guy's going to untap, neglect to pay the tax on the fish, draws card for turn, then in his first main phase he's going to tap for 4, leaving one floating to transmute Muddle the Mixture. Please stop. Who hurt you? He's going, he's going to go get Dockside for those confused about what's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game about Docksides. Yeah, this is Dockside Extortionist the game. Oh, where's mine? After transmuting into his own Dockside Extortionist, he's going to put that into his hand. Then he's going to use the floating mana and tap the Signet for red to cast Dockside Extortionist. When it comes into play, he does a count, and he's going to make a total of four treasures. Once those come into play, he's immediately going to sacrifice three of them so he can replace the fish with a Rhystic Study. After that, he's all finished up, so he's going to pass the turn to Calvin, who will untap, upkeep, and draw his card for turn. In his first main phase, he'll play a Plateau as his land for turn. Then he's going to enter combat and attack Guy with his commander and his hope. Guy's going to block his commander with the Dockside Extortionist, so that's going to die. Then Guy's going to take one from the Hope. Calvin's going to gain two off of his commander. Then in Calvin's second main phase, he's going to lose a life to Timna and draw a card. After that, Calvin's going to tap for three mana, two for the spell, and one to pay for the Rhystic Study. It's going to be for a Tithe Taker. No. And then I'm going to pass it. <laughs> All right, cool. Untap. Upkeep. Draw for turn. Sick. It's a card. 
I'm going to go with my land for turn. It's going to be a City of Brass. Go to combat. Guy, two in the air. You're not going to block? Sweet. I'm going to tap two. <laughs> Jutsu and Yuriko for this thing. Take three. Trigger Skull Snatcher. Exile your dark side. Also, exile your other best card. You can choose. I don't care. Two Yuriko triggers. One. Everyone take zero. Two. Everyone take zero. Put these in my hand. <laughs> I'll play Mox Amber. Not paying. You may draw a card. Cool? Cool. I'm going to tap for three. Losing two. I'm going to cast Doomsday and look at Guy. I will not pay. I'll draw. <laughs> I'll uh, play with. force. Absolutely. Pitch the that happens. This goes to my bin. I will pass the turn. After what was evidently a very aggressive turn, I'll pass over to Chris, who's going to buy back his Squee, and then he's going to draw his card for turn. Then in his first main phase, he's going to tap for one mana, and that's going to be in order to cast a Faithless Looting. That's going to have Guy drawing a card because he doesn't pay the tax. Chris is going to draw two. Then he's going to discard two, and one of those cards that he discarded was the Squee. After that, he's going to tap for one more red mana. He's not going to pay the Ristic Study tax, and he's going to single target Vandal Blast Calvin's Hope of Gear Pier. Guy's going to draw a card. The Hope goes to the graveyard. Chris is going to head into combat, and he's going to attack Calvin with three of his creatures. Guy remembers to lose a life for when he casts Force of Will. Calvin's going to take all the damage and drop down to 23. Then Chris is going to pay three life in his second main phase to play Shatter Skull the Hammer Pass on tapped. Then he's going to flash back Faithless Looting, not paying for the Ristic Study tax. He doesn't have a hand, so he effectively mills two cards into his graveyard, then he passes the turn to Guy. Guy's going to untap, draw his card for turn, then play a Prismatic Vista as his land for turn in his first main phase. After that, he's going to play a Mana Crypt for free, then he's going to tap said Mana Crypt for two mana in order to cast a Talisman of Creativity. After this point, he's going to fetch with his Prismatic Vista, losing a life, dropping down to 25, and he wants to get a Basic Mountain into play untapped. After that, he's going to bend the Vista, then he's going to count out and tap for three red and three blue, losing a life to the Talisman in order to cast his commander, Niv-Mizzet Perun. After that, he has no further action, so he passes to Kelvin, who untaps, draws his card for turn, goes straight into combat, and he's going to attack me with both of his creatures. I'm going to take four, Kelvin's going to gain two, and in Kelvin's second main phase, he'll lose a life and draw a card. After that, Kelvin's going to play a Besiju tapped as his land for turn, and with nothing else, he's going to pass the turn to me. I'm going to untap, draw my card for turn, play a Misty Rainforest as my land for turn, then I'm going to head into combat. I'm going to decide to return the favor and attack Calvin with both of my creatures. He can't block as my creatures have flying, so he takes three, and then I'm going to exile both of the cards in his graveyard thanks to the Skull Snatcher. After that, we have two Yuriko triggers. I'll reveal Ginger Brute, which deals one to the table, and then I'm going to reveal a Blink Moth Infusion, dealing 14 to each of my opponents. Now I have one more action before I leave combat, but this is post-damage. I'm going to Deadly Rollick Niv-Mizzet. I will pay for the Ristic Study, but Guy's going to draw a card anyway because of the Deadly Rollick. Then he gets to point a damage wherever he'd like. He points at Skull Snatcher, but since we're in combat, I get to Ninjutsu in Miss Syndicate Naga in place of my Skull Snatcher. That's going to nullify the damage from the Niv-Mizzet. Niv-Mizzet will die to the Deadly Rollick. And after that, we're going to move to my second main phase. I'm going to tap my City of Brass, losing a life, even though there's an Urborg, so I didn't have to. I'm going to play a Ginger Brute, and then I'm simply going to pass the turn to Chris. Chris is going to untap. He's going to buy back that Squee he keeps putting in his graveyard and draw his card for turn. After that, he's going to activate his Chainer, and this time around, he's going to discard a Goblin Crater Maker. After that, he's going to pay two to recast the Crater Maker from his graveyard. Guy's going to ask him if you'd like to pay the Ristic Study tax, and Chris decides, yes, I would like to pay one so you cannot draw a card. After that, Chris is going to go into combat, and he's going to swing three of his creatures at Calvin, which is going to be lethal, and then the Commander and the Goblin are both going to turn sideways at Guy for a total of five. We're going to head to damage, and Calvin's going to die anyway so he doesn't block. Guy's going to drop down to four life and three commander damage from Chris. Then Chris is just going to pass the turn to Guy. Guy's going to untap, flip for Mana Crypt. He's going to lose the flip and drop down to one life, then draw his card for turn. After that, he's going to tap for three mana, but he's going to let one stay floating to cast Phantasmal Image, and it comes into play as a Dockside Extortionist. When this happens, he's going to make three treasures, and then he's immediately going to cash those treasures in, as well as paying red, 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 and blue, blue, blue. Obviously, this is going to be so he can recast his commander, Niv-Mizzet. With no further actions, he'll pass the turn to me. I'm going to untap, upkeep, and draw my card for turn. Then we're going to go into my first main phase, skip right over that, and go into combat. I'm going to attack Chris with all three of my creatures, but before we even go to blocks, he'll sacrifice the Crater Maker to put two damage on my Miss Syndicate Naga, which kills it. Then he's going to declare no blocks, so I ninja to in Skull Snatcher in place of Ginger Brute, and we go to damage. 
Chris is going to take three. One of them is going to be Commander. Then I'm going to trigger Yuriko and Skull Snatcher. I'll exile the Crater Maker and Slaughter Pack from his graveyard. Then we're going to deal with the two Yuriko triggers, and we're going to flip cards off the top. The first one's Morphic Pool, which is good for zero. And the second one is Phantasmal Image, which is going to kill Guy and bring Chris down to ten. I'll add both of these cards to my hand. Then Guy's going to leave the game, and I'm going to move to my second main phase. I'll play Morphic Pool tapped as my land for turn, because I only have one opponent left. Then I'm going to tap my island for blue, and I'm going to play Sage of Ipter. When that enters play, I'll rearrange the top four cards of my deck. I'll put them back on top in the order that I like. Then I'm going to tap for one and play Ginger Brute. And before passing to Chris, I decide I want just one more creature, so I'll tap for one more mana, lose a life, and I'm going to play Wingcrafter paired with my Yuriko. After that, I'll just pass the turn to Chris. Chris is going to untap, upkeep, draw his card for turn, and then he's going to head straight into combat, and he's going to attack me with his dragon and his plague crafter. I'm going to move to blocks and chump both of them with my sage and my ginger brute. Chris has no further actions, so he passes to me, saying, do your worst. I'm going to untap, upkeep, draw my card for turn, skip straight to combat, attack Chris with everything. He has no flyers, so they're all going to make it through to damage. He's going to take four. Then we're going to trigger Yuriko twice and hit Verdant Catacombs and Swan Song. That's going to cause Chris to drop down to five life. Then we'll move to my second main phase where I'll play Verdant Catacombs as my land for turn. After that, I'll tap for one black mana and I'm going to cast Demonic Consultation. With it, I'm going to name Temporal Trespass. I reveal the top six. It's not there, so I keep going until I hit it. And once I do, I will add it to my hand. I'll take the rest of the cards that I exiled, put them in my exile pile, then I'm going to add the Temporal to my hand, and I'm going to fetch with my Verdant Catacombs, going down to 24, getting an Underground Sea, then I'll also fetch with my other fetch land, I'm going to get a basic Island, shuffle my library, put it back, then we're going to tap for 4 mana and delve 7 cards in order to cast that Temporal Trespass. That's going to have me taking another turn after this one, but before we go to my next turn, I'm going to tap for 2 mana to cast my own Phantasmal Image. This time, I don't want a Dockside. I'm going to copy my Skull Snatcher and go to my next turn. I'll untap, upkeep, draw my card for turn, play Urborg. I'll turn everything sideways at Chris, and we don't even need to do any Yuriko triggers. This is actually enough damage with just combat, leaving me as the winner of today's game. Another one in the bag for Yuriko. Let's talk about how the game went in no real particular order, especially the order doesn't really matter here because everyone kind of got to do what their deck wanted to do. Everyone was at least in some capacity fairly close to ending the game given, you know, given the game had gone for another turn or two. Um, so let's talk about, I guess I'm just going to start up with Guy Scott because it's it, it's kind of hard to see when the Niv-Mizzet deck is about to win the game if you don't know what's going on. So for anyone not in the know, this is a combo deck and one half of the combo is Niv-Mizzet pay run. It's an AB combo, meaning you can execute the combo with two cards, but it needs a little bit of kindling, it needs a catalyst, it needs another spell to be cast to start the chain. How it works is you have Niv-Mizzet and it triggers whenever you draw a card, or no, whenever you cast a spell, but when you draw a card it deals a damage, and if you have a curiosity on it, it kind of feeds into itself over and over. As long as you have enough cards in your library, you can deal lethal damage to everybody with Niv-Mizzet, and it's really hard to interact with because every time you try to interact, it triggers the curiosity that's on Niv-Mizzet. Rather, it triggers the Niv-Mizzet, which then triggers curiosity, which then triggers Niv-Mizzet, and it keeps going. Um, so at this point, we really didn't have the Niv-Mizzet deck. It didn't have access to curiosity. Um, he could have gained access to curiosity, but he really, even if he had it, there weren't a lot of points in the game where he had the opportunity to cast Niv-Mizzet, put curiosity on it, and not be interacted with before the curiosity hit the Niv-Mizzet. So he did a pretty good job playing a control role in the early part of the game. Unfortunately, he just fell behind a little bit. What really didn't help was the fact that his Mystic Remora, um, on turn one, he had like ramp, ramp, Mystic Remora. And based on all of our turn ones, if the turn order had been a little bit different, Guy probably would have had no problem cleaning that game up himself because the Remora would have drawn him like an extra six, seven cards. That's how his game went. Let's talk about Calvin. Calvin's deck also did the thing. He opened up with that land, soul ring, rock, blood pet. He really developed his mana base early on. He played a turn two Timna and then started to farm immediately with the Timna. And that's kind of what his deck wants to do. The only thing he didn't gain access to was a way to start his combo with Dargo. Given a few more turns, he definitely would have been able to get there, and he had the silence effects. He was just like a turn too slow, and that's kind of the problem with these Mad Farm decks, is until you get really proficient in playing these Mad Farm decks, um, if, if your play isn't perfect, you're usually going to fall a little bit short, and that's what happened for Calvin here. He has since switched his playstyle. Expect to see some new stuff from Calvin coming soon. He's discovered the power of my lord and savior, the basic island, and I'm very excited to see what he does with it. Uh, then let's talk about Chris, because Chris's deck was probably the lowest power level deck out of all of ours. 
but um, it was so cool. He abused his Dark Side Extortionist. He played Kakusho, the Evening Star, um, which is actually very good in the matchup with Yuriko, because if he's able to sacrifice it at the right time, he can uh, he can outlast the other players when it comes to Yuriko doing the burn plan, which is what I was on for this particular game. And um, he just wasn't able to outgrind me. He kind of put a little bit, maybe too much attention on taking out Guy and Calvin on the turn where he attacked with all of his creatures. And the problem is when the smoke cleared and everyone was dead, he was, you know, looking directly at me a blue player with seven cards in his hand and a ton of free permissions so no matter how that game went from that point i was probably going to take it and there's really not a lot to say about me the yuriko deck has a scripted turn one turn two it's turn one enabler a guy that's a one drop and has some type of evasion or some type of an etb or some type of subtext like ninja i've got a lot of changeling one drops in my deck at least three um, and then turn to Yuriko, start farming and then maintain control over the game until you can either use a Thassa's Oracle, Demonic Consultation, or Doomsday Win, or what I did in this case was I just burnt Chris out and it was through the help of an extra turn spell. I don't know what Chris had access to, but if it was a potent enough combination of cards to take me out, I didn't have as much permission as I would have liked to. So there was a world where Chris could have pretty easily won that game, but it wasn't the world we're living in for today. Anyway, that's that's how the game went. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Um, let me know what you think about like sometimes maybe playing decks that like these were definitely CDH decks. All of these decks have been, have been tuned somewhat substantially since the recording of this game to be fit like what it really means to be a CDH deck. But uh, if you guys want to see more high, high power level games like this, but not under the pretense, I don't, it's really hard. It gets so muddy when you try to play like as close to CDH as you can without actually playing CDH. And we really like playing CDH. But at the end of the day, our bread and butter is in like budget and optimized content. But uh, maybe we'll try to like push the optimized envelope a little bit more to get some like slower games but with a lot of really high powered interactions, I think is where we kind of want to be for our um, optimized games. But we'll see if you have any thoughts, comments, concerns, leave them in the comments below. By the way, a little, little, uh, really nothing new, but like, hey, we've got playmats. Check them out. It's in the description of this video. If you want to buy a playmat, they're really sweet. I'd recommend it. They're super cool. And all the, you know, the profits from those go to us. And what we do with the profits from those is we use them to hopefully make better videos. By the way, I hope everyone's looking forward to the Dungeons & Dragons set release that's coming soon. And yes, we have a sweet video planned for it. Thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, I will see you next time.